The Sahel is dry, hot and vast, so it's difficult to govern, and that provides room for criminals who've trafficked people, weapons and drugs for years. Still, it was once safe enough to host art and musical festivals and motorsport events. Now, much of it is a danger zone. The conflict that is more widely known from the Sahel is the Boko Haram insurgency in the Lake Chad Basin. That's in its 10th year now, with the group and its splinter factions still posing a stubborn threat. Further west, another potent challenge. There's JNIM, which is linked with Al-Qaeda, and its rival, ISGS, the local affiliate of the so-called Islamic State. Both are active in Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger. Since 2016, attacks on civilians and the military in these countries have increased fivefold. The UN says the violence has left five million children in the Sahel needing humanitarian aid. Regional leaders and their international partners have largely employed an armed response, which they plan to expand. France is leading the way, but on the ground, not many support this former colonial power. In Mali, there are 15,000 UN peacekeepers, but with a limited scope. While they can put on a show of force, their mandate does not allow them to go on the offensive and fight the armed groups. France has pushed for local action and backed a multinational force by the affected nations. It's called G5 Sahel, made up of troops from Mauritania, Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger and Chad. But some donors have not delivered on funding and others are not convinced that this force is the solution. Mali's government has struggled in the battlefield and now it thinks a more effective option might be to sit down and talk things out with the extremist leaders, this despite opposition from France. But with limited military strength and a feeble track record of development, the government appears cornered and desperate, much like its neighbours. Now Mali has been most affected by the crisis and it's the country where it all began. In 2012, separatists and groups linked to al-Qaeda took over the northern part of the country. Military efforts to flush them out were unsuccessful. And now, barely a decade later, armed groups are popping up in other parts of Mali. To date, much of the conflict has been between the country's two dominant ethnic groups, the Muslim Fulani and the Dogon. The Sanu refugee camp on the outskirts of Mali's capital, Bamako. Around 200 huts for about 1,000 people seeking safety from attacks by the Dogon people in the east of the country. The refugees are Fula herdsmen, mostly Muslims, like Zakaria Diallo. The hatred between the Fula and the Dogon peoples runs deep. This troubles Zakaria Diallo. There was a dispute in Mondoro. Then they talked it out. But now, the evil in our midst has reached the village children. Their own parents can no longer influence them. The young people have taken up arms. Also, the soldiers don't draw distinctions anymore. Every single Fula child they see, they regard as a jihadi. Seeing Muslim children as jihadis, it's a widespread attitude among soldiers and the society here regarding an entire ethnic group as the enemy. It's hard to know why it started. On the Dogon side of town, a similar picture emerges. They feel caught in a spiral of violence after massacres in their villages. They too were internally displaced and forced to flee. Umu Teli lost everything. She now depends on handouts. They killed 10 people in a single day. The next day, they killed five. On the third day, they came back and took our livestock, cattle, goats, everything. The people of Mali are not just afraid for their lives. They're fed up with the weak economy, a government they see as corrupt, teachers who don't teach. Tens of thousands have taken to the streets. Muslim cleric Mahmoud Diko is a leading member of the opposition. This is exactly what we've denounced. We can't be complacent about the government leaders who got us into this situation. It has to stop. 
The head of state is mainly responsible. Mahmoud Diko is someone who may be able to help the international community bring peace to Mali. The French army and UN troops, including some from Germany's armed forces, cannot achieve it on their own. At the table with me now is Tommy Oladipo. He's our resident expert on extremism on the continent. Tommy, it's good to see you. We have just seen a report uh, about the situation in Mali. We know that this is a broader situation in the region that is deteriorating. How did we get here? Well, it's complex. Mali has had these problems for a long time. It's had security problems, particularly in the north. Right. There has been a, a disconnect, a kind of lack of understanding between the government in Bamako and uh, people in the north of the country okay. where there's a lot of inequality. And uh, there have been groups there for many years who've been clamoring for uh, even autonomy. Um, but those issues, those socio-political issues have now been overshadowed or even overlap with these jihadist problems we're seeing today because it's volatile, there have been arms, and so jihadist groups have uh, seen it fit that this is the kind of environment they can operate in, uh, and that's why they have come in. But the problem is that unlike the groups that are clamoring for autonomy, mm. you cannot sit down, or at least conventionally sit down with uh, jihadist groups and try and debate and try and negotiate the way forward. Okay. Uh, Toby, these extremist groups, they've, they've been growing stronger over the last decade. How have they been able to do this? Well, they have the space uh, in, in, in the north of Mali or at least across the Sahel, many parts of the Sahel. They have the space, they have the difficult terrain. Um, they have the, the uh, problems where people, there's a lot of poverty and so people are not necessarily against them. People are not necessarily for the government, uh, the, 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 the residents of these areas. And so these jihadists can play on those sentiments uh, as well to get allies within communities because they have a presence everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, they even know these places sometimes better than the government does. And so they're able to operate, uh, carry out hit and run attacks against the, against the government, against the military. Um, and, and that way they cannot be found. And so it's a very difficult problem. Um, and, and what they've then done is that as they build their spread, they're also playing on, uh, for example, ethnic elements, uh, 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 you know, dealing with different ethnic groups and playing on certain uh, those hatreds we see between certain groups and playing on that. And that then sort of gets them more support and more, uh, more of a spread across this region. So we've seen this problem move from Mali, from the north of Mali, go down to the center, central parts of Mali, across the border into Burkina Faso. We're even seeing the edge of Ivory Coast is being attacked at the moment. Uh, so that shows just how right. delicate this is. But having said all of that, right, uh, this is not just an Africa problem. If you look past the Middle East, if you look past what's happening, for example, in Syria, the Sahel is the other major uh, hotspot for, for terror. Uh, and the rest of the world is worried that the main world powers are worried. And that's why, for example, if you look at the, the peace peacekeeping uh, mission in Mali, that's the only one that has attracted some of the world's top powers. You're talking about the Dutch, you're talking about the Germans who've got massive contingents in there right. because they want to use that as a way of getting intelligence, for example. We see the French obviously have, have got their thousands of troops in the Sahel as well. Uh, the US has built a drone base in Niger and is operating there. So for example, recently we saw the French uh, army kill uh, a top commander of Al-Qaeda in Northern Mali and they used American intelligence to do that. So we see that a lot of these countries are worried that this is not just a problem happening somewhere over there, far away, but this is a problem that can spiral and breed jihadists who can come in and, and be a threat on their own shores. And so the world is worried about this, uh, but this, is a, is a phenomenon that's not just limited to the Sahel. We're seeing uh, the rise of jihadism in East Africa, the Horn of Africa. That's right. We're seeing even in Southern Africa, for example, south of Tanzania, north of Mozambique, that area has also become a, a, a breeding ground for jihadists. And lately we've seen the, the Mozambican jihadists going on the rampage to the point where even the government there is struggling and is looking for outside help. All right. Tommy Oladipo, as ever, our resident expert on extremism on the continent. Thank you for that. Thank you. There are thousands of jihadi fighters in the region. And that brings us to the question we're asking today. Why are so many young people being lured into these militant groups? 
In a moment, we'll hear from a former fighter about his personal reasons. But first, have a listen to what other people in Africa think. I think everything boils down to poverty. They are reportedly treated nicely by these groups. The youth have been neglected. The Islamic notion of um, five edges. It's unemployment, frustration. Parents have failed in their responsibilities. Young people feel that they have been left out, they have not been heard. Literacy and ignorance. Probably they didn't get the right education. There is ignorance of what the religion is all about. Because of lack of understanding of what the tenement of Islam is. They don't know the right thing they are doing. Because the Bible said, my people perish because they lack it wisdom. Idleness. Idleness. Denial of resources or unequal distribution of the national cake. Extrajudiciary killing is the driver to take youth to join this malicious group. It's because of unemployment. In Kenya, we have many educated people. An example, Exhibit A, I am a degree holder. I have friends who are doctors, who are, law, who are accountants, who are architects, who are engineers, who are unemployed. So, the voices of people there. Now we go to Mombasa, Kenya, where we met a former Al-Shabaab fighter who's now turned his life around. We hear in his own words why he got involved with the jihadists in the first place. Mohamed Mburu fought nearly two years for the terrorist group. The former Christian converted to Islam and went to Somalia as a foreign fighter. Now he speaks out for the first time about his radicalization and how he got away from Al-Shabaab. For security reasons, we need to cover his real identity. Poverty, where I come from, it's a bit harsh. Like you see, you have kids, they don't go to school. You eat like one meal a day. The major issue that's disturbing youth there is unemployment, lack of jobs, drug addiction, you know, stealing. Because there you don't have jobs, so you have to just sit around, wait for whatever will come. A terrorist recruiter promised Mohammed $500 monthly to fight in Somalia. He accepted. Like many others, he saw his recruitment as a job, the only way to flee from poverty. Mohammed was then trained in Mombasa and sent to Somalia. You know, when you start to shoot, the adrenaline comes into the body. You start to shoot even at the dog, at the cat. You even shoot at a woman. There's one time I remember there was a pregnant woman. The woman was dead. I could see her baby crying. Mommy, 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 mommy. I asked myself, is this right? Mohammed managed to escape Al Shabaab, but he was wounded. Back in Kenya, he was given amnesty. Mohammed is now supporting the authorities. That was the main condition for his amnesty. He now warns others about the risks. There is nothing like holy war in the Quran. Find a good sheikh who will teach you. And first, stay away from people you, who you might think, who you know are Muslim and they have money, but you don't know where the income comes from. But as long as poverty prevails, there will be young Africans who follow the call of money. I'm now joined by Mutaru Mumuni Mukta. He's from the West African Center of Counter-Extremism, and he joins me from the Ghanaian capital, Accra. Welcome to DW News Africa. We've been hearing that poverty is one of the main reasons young people are joining terror groups. Do you think then that the response to the crisis um, from governments uh, and other partners is too militaristic and not addressing the real problem? Well, the problem of terrorism in Africa generally, it's a product of or a manifestation of the frustrations and anguish of youth who have generally lost faith in their states and the state's ability to ensure they provide a legitimate means of livelihood for them. You see a significant number of young people who are unemployed, you know, affected by several other challenges 
And so poverty is one of the single biggest factors, but it's not the whole story. The other factors that lead, I mean, that was, I mean, relate to dysfunctional societies, people who come from dysfunctional social backgrounds, you know, complemented by issues of poverty, unemployment, you know, inequality, and negative religious or political ideals. So poverty is just one of them. And so to successfully counter terrorism or this, the current wave of violent extremism, we need to ensure we have a holistic, you know, comprehensive approach to dealing with the drivers of radicalization and violent extremism. Right. So another thing is, for, for, the, for the young fighters who do return to, to society, there is this conversation about, do we give them amnesty or, or do we just concentrate on, on rehabilitating them um, and without necessarily imposing punitive measures, i.e. prison? Where do you stand on that? Well, no, any one particular case is the same. You know, every single case is unique. And so for you to ensure, I mean, to provide amnesty for any so-called repentant, you know, fighters, we need to analyze case by case basis. They are individuals, we need to assess them to determine whether they would still pose a threat to society when they are put back into society. You need to ensure you thoroughly examine this in order to avoid you know, escalated the problems, even when you undergo uh, amnesty programs. And so it has to be determined by case by case, depending on the profile of the individual or the individuals involved. But yes, it's important to ensure that we take people through amnesty, rehabilitation, de-radicalization program, a kind of program that helps to revise or reverse their outlook in life and ensure that we uh, practically enhance their ability to fend for themselves in terms of learning skills, you know, empowerment skills that can, you know, provide livelihoods for them when they get back into society. So what does it take to, to rehabilitate somebody? We often quote things like reintegrating people into society, but from the work that you're doing, which is what you do on a daily, what does it take to actually rehabilitate somebody and put them back into society? You first need to analyze the person's, assess the person's own vulnerabilities and the fact that that led the person to that point. And once you're able to determine, was it as a result of negative religious ideals, was it as a result of poverty, is as, as a result of a sense of marginalization or inequality or dysfunctional social factors in the society. Once you're able to determine that, you go back, you know, you work backwards to reverse that trend to ensure that he is adequately put in a position where he can positively participate in society. So this young guy, 21 years, we had to go through his, you know, his past and assess these factors. We realized that through the de-radicalization process, he was committed and willing to go back to school. We helped him go back to school. We paid for his schooling and everything related to schooling. Two years after that, he graduated from school and is currently working in journalism with the media house. That is what it means to get somebody positively back into society to ensure that they are positive contributors to society. De-radicalization is a very complex task that, that requires discipline to thoroughly examine each individual's case to be able to get them positively back into society. If you don't get this right, you are actually under mining and putting this general society at risk. Okay, that is Mutaru Mumuni Mukta. He's from the West African Center of Counter-Extremism. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for your insights. And of course, we continue to hope that your work continues, that more people uh, will be brought back into society successfully. Thank you. And as always, we would love to hear your thoughts on this topic. If you're watching this online, write in the comments section, or you can get in touch with me directly. My Twitter handle is at Mundwa7.